Fred and Ethel <laughs> loved the county fair. And they went to the county fair because every year they went to the county fair. And this year there was something new at the fair. And Fred saw it and he wanted very much to be a part of it. There was a big helicopter on a pad and a sign in front of the helicopter that said, Helicopter rides $50. Ethel came walking up and Ethel said to Fred, Fred, that helicopter ride is $50 and $50 is $50. We don't have it. Let's go. And she yanks Fred and takes him off and he stumbles and pouts and complains and gripes the rest of the day. They go home and the next day is the last day of the fair and Fred talks Ethel into going again. After a while, Fred wanders off, and Ethel can't find him, but she knows where he is. So she goes over, and there he is, standing there, just looking at that helicopter. She walks up, and she says, What did I tell you yesterday? We don't have $50. That helicopter ride is $50. Fred, $50 is $50. <sighs> he puts his foot down, and they start to walk away, and then all of a sudden, they hear, Folks, wait a minute. And it's the pilot of the helicopter. He says, I couldn't help but overhear you, because Ethel's mouth is so loud. I overheard that you couldn't ride this helicopter because you can't afford it. Tell you what I'll do. I'm going to take you up in my helicopter. If you can stay quiet the whole time, I won't charge you a penny. Well, old stingy Ethel loved that idea. So they hop in, and up he goes, and he gets up to about 1,200 feet, and then he banks real hard to the right. And then he banks real hard to the left. And he spins and turns and pulls out every trick from all of his many years as a professional pilot. But no matter what he does, not a peep from the back. Not a sound. He can't believe it. And as he's landing the chopper, he says, folks, I've got to tell you, in 30 years of flying, I have never failed to get someone to yell out. What's your secret? How did you do it? And old Fred said, well, to tell you the truth, I almost said something when Ethel fell out. <laughs> <laughs> but $50 is $50. <laughs> the moral of the story is, sometimes it pays to keep your mouth shut. Here we are today talking about the two things we're not supposed to talk about. Faith or religion or belief and politics. We're mixing them together like fire and gasoline. What in the crap are you doing? And of course, you ask me to do it because I'm already controversial, as Lloyd can tell you. So I really don't care, so I, I sort of thrive in controversy. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you're feeling about the election. By now you should be healed. I mean, it's already pretty much over. The inauguration is coming down the line. So are you not healed? Raise your hands if you're not healed. Oh, a bunch of bleeding wounded ones in here today. Injured. Injured. People ask me about this, and they've been bringing it to my private practice, and they've been bringing it to funerals and weddings, and everywhere I go, people are pulling me aside saying, Mark, what's going on? And my first thought is, well, how in the heck am I supposed to know? <laughs> but they think I have answers, so I go ahead and lie to them. Tell them whatever they want to hear, or at least I try to answer their questions, or at least I listen to their concerns. And... Usually, I'm pretty busy on Sundays, and today is no exception. I'm dressed down for you guys because you let me, but I have three funerals this afternoon that I have to wear a tie for, so I have to rush off. So when I was asked to sort of feather in some q and I'm more than happy to cut short my initial comments and just sort of go with where you want to go with it, because I don't mind doing that at all. I can just go with the flow. So let me first start by saying that Control is an illusion. You realize that? You're Unitarians. You should recognize that control is an illusion. Always has been. Now there's an exception for Dennis and Lorraine because when Lorraine kicked him, he came up. So she's got some control. But that's a marriage. That's a husband and wife thing. In general, 
the idea that we can control anything is illusory. We might influence it, we might make our voice known, and we're entitled to that. But control, uh-uh. Try and control other people, waste of time, exercising futility. And yet, interestingly, we do it. We misuse a lot of our energy with controlling or attempting to control things that are out of our control, like the election. Unless, of course, you're Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you have some control. Look, the light agrees. <laughs> Without getting too political and trying to avoid all of the traps that come with the media and what the media chooses to tell us and not tell us, let's just sort of talk about your feelings about this. Uh, I'd like to share with you that from my perspective, as a theologian first, a philosopher second, and a clinical psychotherapist third, my sense of balance is rooted in my spiritual sense of faith. Nothing rocks me. No storm, no chaos, no unexpected hurricane can unsettle my foundations. I may not like what's happening, I may not agree with the approaching storm, but I have never, 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 never moved from my foundation because my foundation is based on my spiritual sense of faith. And I'm not talking about church or organized religion. I don't believe you can organize God. He's too big to organize, although people try all the time. I'm talking about I am spiritually at peace with whatever happens. You know why? The light knows why. <laughs> but you don't know why because the light hasn't come on yet. Did you go outside last night and look up in the sky and see the stars? If you didn't, do it tonight. You're not just looking at the stars. You're not just gazing into the realms of the evening. You're learning the meaning of your pathetic small life. <coughs> you are not all there is. That's called perspective. When you look at the stars, it should become obvious to you that we are small and a very vast, huge universe. And the tiny little goings on in a place called Washington or the United States of America, while important, are not all there is. There's so much more. It gives us perspective, and it somehow brings us out of our small-mindedness. And isn't it true that we become very exclusivistically narrow-minded when it comes to our political views at times? And yet Unitarians are supposed to be all-embracing, all-loving. There is nothing outside the purview of a Unitarian. And yet, I just sit back and watch and listen at the frothy mouthed attacks mounted by Unitarians. I expect that from a Baptist. <laughs> I expect that from a Lutheran. I don't expect that from an all-inclusive, embracing, Unitarian, Universalist who's okay with everything. What a contradiction human beings are. What a contradiction Unitarians seem at times to be. Now, I recognize that your explanation, otherwise known as an excuse, is, I'm passionate! You're allowed to be passionate. You should experience passion. And yet, sometimes passion can sort of translate, can't it, into inappropriate use of energy? I didn't recognize until she told me that she was going to record me this morning. So I'm going to be extra inappropriate. <laughs> I'm going to read to you what guides me, and then I'm going to open the floor. How many of you believe in the truth or the wisdom found in the Old and or New Testament? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't really care how many of you raise your hands. I'm just interested in the ones that are willing to do it. This is what keeps me sane. God is our refuge, and God is our strength, an ever-present being in times of trouble. America's in trouble. Have you noticed that? <laughs> America is in trouble. Every institution is in trouble. Its foundations are in trouble. We know that. Therefore, I will not fear even if the earth seems to give away. Even if the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roast and foam and struggle in their surging. God is with us. God will help us at the break of every day. Next line, it's America. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms are falling and rising. But the voice of God, when God speaks, the earth melts. That's called perspective. That's called recognition of larger forces at work. If the Lord Almighty is with us, come and see the works of God. And my favorite line, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among every nation. I will be exalted all over the earth. In other words, no matter what happens, it's all going to work out just fine in the end. I don't worry. I'm moving. I don't worry <laughs> ever about the goings-on in Washington or Tallahassee. The interest is there. I have an opinion, of course, but am I worried about it? What a waste of my time and my energy. I do not do it. I'm speaking for me. I'm not speaking for Unitarians or for you. My worrying does nothing to change the consequences. It does nothing to influence what has happened. And as one who has spent 35 years in the presence of trauma and chaos and crap, technical term, crap, I can tell you from experience that crap is often necessary for good to show up. Am I right? Yes. You in the room who have grown and matured because everything's been easy, you're not really alive. Life is about the struggle, and human beings by nature and historically only grow when things don't go their way. We grow in the midst of struggle and in the midst of hurricanes and storms, not when it's calm. When it's calm and things go our way, we don't pray. We don't need to because everything's going fine. It's only when things aren't going well that even the atheists and the agnostics and the I don't knows will walk up to me and say, pray for me. <laughs> and I always look them in the eye and say, you don't believe in God. Oh, I see. Now you're in trouble. Now you don't know what to do, so you're willing to try anything. Very human nature of us, isn't it? I'm a human. I know because I'm the same way. When things are going our way, we don't worry. When things are going the way we think we want them to go as if we know best, we're fine. But when things take a turn for the worse or the unexpected and it scares us, we farm out our concerns to something larger than ourselves and then we get pissed when we don't get the answer we want. Am I right? Yes, I am. You know how I know? Because they come to my office. I'm pissed. I'm angry. I said, oh, two days ago you were in, in pleading and begging and willing to do anything. And now you're mad. Very childlike. It's like mother and father saying yes and no and yes and no and yes and no. Well, human beings grow up, but sometimes they don't mature. We're still little kids on the inside. This election is no different. We didn't get our way. Many, like on the playground, have grabbed their marbles and left. They're not playing anymore. 
Others are standing firm and marching. Some are standing on the playground not knowing what to do, waiting for the next direction. Many are having nightmares. Nightmares! Didn't you already have nightmares about Donald Trump before the election? <laughs> I, the fact that he was even running should have concerned you. But then not really. Because if you're a student of American history, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Look where we are in the 21st century. Look what electronics and technology and media has done for us. Anybody can be president. Anybody can buy it and manipulate and control it. It's no longer Abraham Lincoln's days. We're a long way from that. Why were you surprised? And yet people were shocked and angered because they thought and still think that their ideals are somehow now in jeopardy. And yet, I can tell you, at least for me, I can't speak for Lloyd or Nancy, but I can tell you that my life really hasn't changed one bit since he was elected. I still pee every day. <laughs> I still eat daily. My job still keeps me employed. My ideals and beliefs and my energy for what's right and wrong has not changed or shifted. I keep right on doing what my heart sings to do, and I will not be stopped. So how has it impeded or affected me? It hasn't, and I refuse to worry about what may be. While everyone else is worried about, <gasps> what's going to happen? How many times have you worried about crap that has never actually happened? Most of us can't predict our day or match our socks, much less what will happen when someone new gets in office. I can tell you, if you study history, if you've studied it at all, not just American, but world history, you will already know that it takes evil rulers to shape nations. You don't believe that? Look at Babylon, look at Rome. Just take a look. It's a necessary shift in energy. And we're about due for it, aren't we? Maybe he's exactly what the doctor ordered. He was certainly placed in office with the use of modern technology. Questions? <laughs> Concerns? Maybe I should have the mic so everyone can hear me. Well, do what you want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Clearly I am. I'm dressed this way. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I freaked out, obviously, at the results of the election. But that's not what my question or concern is about today, because I believe that, like it or not, it, it, it's happening. And we have to unite and work against whatever we see coming down the pike that's against our interests. So that's positive, right? Yeah. Working is positive. My concern is my personal feelings towards people I considered friends and family who voted for Donald Trump. I am one of those passionate UUs. I get blinded sometimes with, with rage and incomprehension. Mm -hmm. How could this be? What kind of a person are you? But I don't want to be there. I want to find some peace and re reconciliation with these people. Um, these people are your family. And friends. And friends. Um, I don't want to go through any more of avoiding them and feeling angry at them. Are you the one avoiding them? I am. Then stop it. That okay. simple. Stop it. Yourself. Tell me how to make peace with myself. I'll tell you how to make peace with yourself. Number one, forgive them for their choices. Number two, recognize they have the right to their choices, just like you have the right to your choices. That's very Unitarian. It's called self-determination. Other humans are entitled to make their own choices. You don't have to like it. In fact, we often do not. 
But it is necessary that each human be responsible for his or her own choices and be permitted to do so and supported by those who say they love them. You cannot love somebody unless you allow them to make choices for themselves, even if you disagree. And if you disagree and you hold it against them, then you do not love them. Because that is not what love is. Love accepts as is. What father or mother stops loving a child because the child chooses a path that is incongruent with that person's concept for them? So the definition of love, particularly to family and friends, if you want them in your life is to accept them as is, warts and all. Simple. That frees you. Because if you have the nerve to be angry at them and refuse to forgive them, then what you're essentially doing, my dear Connie, is you are drinking poison and expecting them to die. And it won't work. It's going to kill you. So to free yourself, you let it go. What business is it of yours what they think? You've got enough on your plate in your own life to handle your own stuff. Pull your own red wagon and worry about that. That's my thought, in a nutshell. Because we don't have much time, I just distilled it down. A lot of people are in your shoes. Thank you for having the courage to say it out loud. They're angry at other people who made choices that surprised them. They're finding out on Facebook. <laughs> or other means. And it's creating tension and conflict which is really very unfortunate because these are people you've loved and known who share DNA with you and yet now you're mad. They have the right to make their choices. I have friends and family who have made all kinds of strange, crazy, completely stupid choices. But I empower them to do it. I'll even walk up and say, I don't agree with your choice, Nancy. However, my love for you is constant, it is unwavering, and I will support you no matter what. That's love. And I'm prepared to pay the price for that, to be in the presence of those who don't always agree with me and who make different choices than I make. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. It's very liberating. And it's the only way to fly. You're going to meet lots of people in life, especially if you're a Unitarian, who don't agree with you, who don't think like you do. Yay! Isn't that the beauty of it? You don't want them all to think just like you. Open and allow them to be who they are and empower them if you love them. Now, just because you love them, last thing I'll say about this, and just because they're in your love pattern doesn't mean you have to spend time with them or associate with them. I have a lot of family and friends that I deliberately don't hang around. <laughs> Doesn't mean I have to spend time or have lunch or have wine with you. But I'm there for you if you need me, and my love for you is constant. But I make choices as well about who I spend my time with. Thank you. That was a... You went to the heart of it. <laughs> <laughs>